dear friends a very good morning to you all i'm very happy that i could meet you all during the pandemic lockdown through an online platform like this first and foremost i would like to thank solis the society for literary studies and professor s prabha for having initiated this kind of a very meaningful academic venture thank you dr prabha for making these depressing stressful days a little refreshing with this great initiative i hope all our lectures would be highly benefiting both the student and teaching communities friends i hope all of you would have uh, enjoyed listening to the earlier lecture by professor s prabhakar on literary theory the basics my topic of discussion today is liberal humanism before getting into my topic of discussion i would like to add a few things to the lecture presented by dr prabhaga for a layman's understanding literature can be defined as a medium through which the society articulates to itself literature is always silent it never speaks at all it is only literary criticism which makes literature speak and for a literary critic to assess and evaluate a work of art the theoretical ammunition is provided by literary theories to put it in simpler terms literature is silent literary criticism makes literature speak and literary theory enables a critic to assess and evaluate a work of art in a much more systematic manner with this layman's understanding of literary theory literary criticism and literature let me get into my topic of discussion liberal humanism what is liberal humanism liberal humanism as the name suggests or implies is a liberative principle it has in fact liberated the humanity from the clutches with which it has been tied up with for quite a long time indeed it has rescued humanity from the cruel clutches of god religion and the divine forces the primary concern of liberal humanist trend liberal humanist stance is to effect a paradigm shift a paradigm shift from the acceptance of a god centric universe to the acknowledgement of a man centric universe so a paradigm shift from a god centric discourse to a man centric discourse is the success of the liberal humanist stance or position so a liberal a humanist tries to establish a specific thing that any human crisis can be solved even without making requests to the divine forces so man centric interpretation of the universe of life of self is possible and hence there is no need for involving the gods involving the divine forces involving the supernatural elements for any kind of human activity 
so they tried to assert one thing that the sovereignty of self is grounded is rooted in the rationality of our consciousness they are very much close to the romantics but there is a subtle difference between the new uh, between the liberal humanists and the romantics the romantics openly propagated or openly uh, said openly stated that there is no god the liberal humanists never ever said there is no god they were not in a position to uh, propagate that there is no god they were not in a position to challenge the supremacy of god they were not in a position to uh, contest or to challenge the authority of god they were not even in a position to question the existence of god in a way they took a pacifist turn a pacifist stance they never said there is no god but they tried solving human crisis with the intervention of man himself so if at all a man needs to be interpreted he should be interpreted only in terms of himself and not in terms of the divine in a way the liberal humanist tried liberalizing or having or developing a liberal attitude towards divinity or i would even say they tried rationalizing their attitude towards divinity so i would like to place this specific liberal humanist trend in between two giant leaps in the field of literary criticism and also in other spheres of knowledge i would even say liberal humanism is a tiny mole situated in between two big mountains traditionalism and romanticism traditionalism believed that god exists god has created this world god is governing and determining and controlling everything in this world and hence they believed in a god centric universe even in tamil there is a saying that avanindri or anuvum asayadu which means not even a single atom would move without him capital h similarly in the west the capital g the god he exercised his authority his power over the universe and the inhabitants of the universe so the traditional thinkers the traditionalists believed in a god centric universe they also believed subsequently that language is god given is god supplied god is word word is god and hence a literature which makes use of such a language which is god given is also very much divine so language is god sent literature is divine and the writer who writes something a uh, writer who produces something becomes a creator almost close to a god the original creator he was revered as a creator so language is god supplied literature is divine and the writer becomes a creator and if a poet wants to write a piece of poem he needs to seek the blessings of god he needs to seek the intervention of the divine forces he needs to seek the assistance of the supernatural elements more importantly he has to invoke the muse to write a piece of poem so to put it very uh, sharp without a muse a poet is of no use even uh, john milton has invoked the muse and in his prologue he invoked the muse and then tried to justify ways of god to men 
but unfortunately he traced the ways of Satan to Eve, the woman. All poets, they invoked the muse. Even the romantics had a different kind of muse, not a religious divine muse, but they had a different kind of muse which very conscious individuals can understand what type of muse the romantics used to get inspiration to write poems. My drowsy numbness paints my sense. With a flood the visionary gleam. Even Bharatiyar, the Tamil nationalist poet, invoked the muse. He could write all his masterpieces only after reaching Puducherry. The, the muse was supplied by Puducherry to Bharatiyar. So without a muse, there is no use. Keep this, keep this as, uh, uh, as, as the essence of traditionalism. Now come to Romanticism, a very radical atheistic movement, a movement which openly proclaimed that there is no God, a movement which openly challenged the authority of God, a movement which questioned the existence of God, and a movement which rejected the very notion of a God-centric universe. And the God-centric universe was replaced by Romanticism with a nature-oriented universe or a man-centric universe. So language for a romantic is not God-given but an outcome of man's continuous interaction with nature, his communion with nature, his relationship with nature and his love for nature. So language is not God-given anymore, it is man-made or it is natural. And now if a literature makes use of this language which is not God-given, then that literature is not divine but human. So in the traditional discourse, language is divine, literature is divine and the writer is a creator. But in Romanticism, language is natural, literature is human and the writer becomes an author, not a creator. I would like to situate the liberal humanist slightly before the Romantic revolutionary movement. They aped they carried certain important tenets of Romanticism. But then they differed in one aspect that they never said there is no God. The liberal humanism is not anti-God as the Romantic movement was. So this kind of uh, tradition, the liberal uh, humanist tradition, tried to search for universal truths, moral values, basic human values in all forms of literature. If you go on searching for the history of the evolution of liberal humanism as a philosophical movement or as a theoretical movement, you have to go back to Aristotle, Plato and other thinkers who discussed a lot about logics, reason, emotion, cognizance and other such things. But then if you want to trace the emergence of liberal humanism as a trend in literary criticism, we need to visit the 18, 20s, 30s and 40s. It was in the year 1826 that English language studies got institutionalized and democratized. 
English language was democratized for the first time and it was thrown open to all and sundry to learn and unlearn. And prior to that, English language was monopolized by the churches and English language was considered only as a liturgical language. It was, it was used only for the ritualistic purposes and also to read and interpret the gospel and also to propagate the gospels. But it's not used by all, it's not used by the commoners, it's not used by a lay, uh, a lay population. So English language studies, when it got institutionalized, the middle class people who were the immediate beneficiaries of this emergence of or the institutionalization of English language studies, learnt and unlearnt the English language. They started learning English language as a secular language, as not as a religious language, not as a liturgical language. So one such pioneer of the English studies a group, the English language studies group, F. D. Maurus, in the year 1940, laid down certain precepts to be followed by liberal humanists. He started formulating certain tenets for liberal humanism. So the first important uh, tenet of liberal humanism is Every human being has an unchanging nature. Each and every individual has something that is unchanging, constant and very much stable. Though their outward behavioral systems change and get modified, with their, with, with their external influences or with their exposure to the outside, uh, the environmental influences. Certain essential qualities remain the same. Certain essential qualities remain unchanging. So each and every individual, irrespective of the geographical spaces, irrespective of the cultural uh, boundaries, irrespective of the linguistic competencies, irrespective of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, racial differences, irrespective of class variations, each and every individual carries something unique, certain qualities that are unchanging and constant. The constancy of these basic qualities of all human beings are considered as universal qualities. So a human being, when he has unchanging qualities, the innate goodness that exists in all human beings, irrespective of their uh, professions, irrespective of their uh, cultural upbringings, that specific unchanging nature of an individual is very much uh, searched upon by the liberal uh, humanists. So such a quality, such a universal value, the liberal humanist is searching in every text across the world. So literature that records, that expresses this kind of a human experience, the experience of a person who is uh, who is full of or who possesses certain unchanging traits, certain unchanging qualities, basic human qualities, is also timeless. It transcends time and space. So uh, uh, an individual is either antecedent to the external influences like culture, society, the economic changes, etc., or 
the individual transcends all these external forces of society, culture and other things. So this specific literature which transcends time and space, which, which covers the life of, which expresses the uh, experiences of this specific uh, individual whose nature is unchanging is timeless. And a writer who tries to write such a timeless text needs to have sincerity to create a timeless text. The writer should be sincere enough to bridge the gap between the language and the language enacted real life. So there is always a difference, a distance between real life and the representation of that real life through a mode called language. But that distance, that difference should be decimated by, uh, 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 by a writer when he uses the language. So a writer is supposed to be sincere enough to use a very proper, ordinary, honest language to represent, to enact reality as it is. He should not indulge in using a very deceptive language. So literature is highly autonomous. Every literary text becomes highly autonomous and independent of preconceived notions. So when you try to approach a literary text, when a liberal humanist approaches a literary text, he should not approach the text with its context. Since the text is autochthonous, since the text is independent, since the text is free from any preconceived notion from the past, the critique should interpret the text only in terms of itself, not in terms of its context. So he need not go in search of the socio-cultural, historical, autobiographical, personal melee of a specific text or of the other. That's needless. So when a critique involves in this kind of an interpretation, interpreting a text uh, uh, by itself, because the text has meanings in itself, you need not go in search of the external forces that determine the meanings because the meanings are all uh, packed intact inside the text. The meaning is fixed. So then the critique has to involve in a close textual reading. And since he need not go in search of all other external influences, more specifically the contextual uh, uh, meanings, his job is reduced to be a mediator between the text and the reader. With that, his job is over. So for such a timeless text, which is autochthonous and independent and can be judged without any uh, preconceived notions, one more quality is very much required and insisted upon by the liberal humanists. That is the fine blend of form and content. In, uh, in, in, in the words of liberal uh, humanists, the form and content, as we have seen in the popular cigarette advertisement, made for each other, form and content are made for each other. Form and content are mutually uh, coexisting. Form and content are mutually adaptive. The form is all accommodative of the content and the content is very much and the content uh, 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 is inherently fitting into the form uh, without tampering the framework. So uh, in, in many traditional societies, in indigenous native uh, cultures, we have uh, a literary genre uh, like lullabies and funeral songs in which the form and content are mutually flexible and adaptive, made for each other. 
you can't just pull out a single word or add a single word to a lullaby or a funeral song which will spoil which will demolish which will bulldoze the very framework the very structure of the literary genre so with all these expected qualities liberal humanist went on uh, searching for the moral values and the basic human values and certain a certain form a uh, discipline in the form in all kinds of uh, literary works so what happened as an extension of this liberal uh, humanism two major strands in literary criticism emerged one is a text led practical criticism followed by i.e richards f.r lewis and t.s eliot and others and the other one is the idea led philosophical criticism which has uh, practitioners like uh, philip sidney william wordsworth henry james matthew arnold dr johnson and others so though it has influenced the formalist school and the philosophical critical school in many ways liberal humanism is considered as an outdated theory of late because it has a lot of shortcomings let me quickly sum up the shortcomings of liberal uh, humanism as well the first important thing is the liberal uh, humanists most of them belong to the middle class though they reacted against the god centric discourse they could not rescue themselves from the middle class ethos so they presented the western literature as if it were the world literature turning their ears closed to the voices of the rest of the world for them the orient is not part of their world secondly the way in which they canonized the elitist european white centric uh, texts which are very much racist in nature as western literary masterpieces that also comes into severe attack and the third important thing is accepting the dialect of the middle class as the norm of the language so in a way the liberal humanists including morris secured the middle class values and they tried transmitting it to the future generation so that the middle class values will become the universal values so first and foremost the uh, human nature as unchanging this very point is contested whatever we thought of as unchanging in human beings including our notion of identity is not fixed our notion of identity and anything which we think as constant in human beings or not constant they are all changing they are all anebic and ever changing and then the idea of objectivity is yet another problem for the liberal humanists they insisted that the text can be interpreted without any preconceived notions but at the same time they tried camouflaging themselves or they tried sacrificing their own ideological commitments in the name of objectivity and neutrality neutrality is always a myth and their concept of truth their search for truth of late we don't believe in the existence of truth 
we believe in the existence of truths multiple multiple versions of truths so truth is a matter of perspective truth becomes relative so all these shortcomings are there in uh, the liberal humanist position say for example in the late uh, 20th century all isms that emerged in the 70s the 70s uh, all the theories that flooded the literary criticism market in the 70s all the theories in one way or the other you know almost all the theories were reacting against the tenets of liberal humanism liberal humanism minus men is liberal feminism for marxists uh, uh, any literary work cannot be produced in vacuum a man cannot be interpreted only in terms of himself but only in terms of the fellow human beings the members of the society without society there exists no literature for marxist literature is neither a god sent piece nor a man meditated piece but a part of the larger productive processes a writer becomes a producer a worker marx is a romantic freud subverted the very essence of the uh, the the liberal humanist uh, position when liberal humanist tried saying the sovereignty of self is rooted in the uh, rationality of consciousness freud said the sovereignty of self is rooted not in the rationality of consciousness but in the irrationality of unconsciousness the post structuralist when these people said we are users of language we should use language very honestly post structuralists believe that we are not users of language anymore we are we are very we are very we, we are products of language we are the very products of language because language precedes our existence and there is no fixed meaning meaning becomes arbitrary very ambiguous every text is a text of so many other texts so all these theories uh, either contest or resist or react against the liberal uh, humanist uh, tenets but whatever said and done whatever we use as a standard working definition for many of our things our day to day affairs even the concepts of individualism the concept of liberty the concept of humanity all such things are products of or outcome of the liberal humanist position so without a proper understanding of the liberal humanist trend one cannot understand all other recent theories thank you so much